Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. If you're a guest with us this morning, we are delighted that you're here to worship the Lord with us. We'd love to know of your presence with us. There's a registration pad in front of you. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out and uh, leaving it in the book, we would appreciate that. That also goes for all of our members and regular guests as well so that we can uh, know of your presence, know how to pray for you. There's a place in there where you can list specific prayers that you may have and it's our privilege on Mondays to pray for the needs that you have. I have a couple of announcements I want to share with you. First of all, in two weeks, in the Sunday evening service, we have our annual Labor Day picnic. All of the details of that picnic and all of the other activities that are beginning to kick off here in the fall season of our life together, you can find in your announcement sheet. So be certain and take this home with you and read it carefully. It'll give you all the details you need. Also, this Wednesday evening at 6.30 in St. Andrew's Hall, we will have our fall Bible kickoff. We're going to be studying the book of Ruth in our Bible studies this fall. It's an amazing, wonderful picture of God's redemptive story and love for his people, the book of Ruth. So you will be encouraged by it. We're going to take an overview of it on uh, Wednesday evening and just build some community. And you can also sign up for those community Bible study groups either Wednesday night or anytime online on our website. Finally, I just want to remind you, particularly uh, you ladies, that you have a, a treat, an opportunity to hear Nancy Guthrie September 15th and 16th right here at First Presbyterian Church. That announcement is also uh, in your announcement sheet. I think, ladies, you probably have received a brochure for that event as well. But I have exciting news. Originally, the price was $75. Now the price is $25. Now you might be thinking, well, we dropped the price because registration was low. Well, that's not true. There are some benefactors in this church that love you ladies so much that they want to make sure that everyone who wants to come will be able to come. And so they are giving and underwriting part of the cost of that conference so that you can come. So what a wonderful opportunity. You can sign up for that online as well. And let me ask you now, if you would, as we prepare our hearts to worship, to remember that this God that we serve and love sent his son, Jesus. And it's because of Jesus that we're here worshiping together this morning. Cross. Mm-hmm. 
Please stand. Psalm 100 calls us to worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us worship God. to this great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you this morning that through the death and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus, the darkness has been scattered. This morning we see a visual picture, the bright, shining sunshine of a new day of our salvation, all because of the sacrifice of your son. So we come here this morning, Father, to praise you. And the verse that we have on our bulletin, not to us, not to us, it's not just a saying for us. We come this morning, Father, praising you and saying you are the reason we are here. And we're here to glorify you. So may our worship this morning be an expression of our deep gratitude for all the ways that you have loved us, most especially and beautifully in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our confession of faith this morning is taken from the historic Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our New Testament lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. You can find uh, this passage in your pew Bible on page 1,666. John chapter 10, beginning with the 11th verse. Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Now over to verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can match, snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The grass withers and the flowers fall. It should be so encouraging to us this morning to read a passage like this and realize that the Father and the Son are one. Because what that means for us not only is Jesus our salvation through his death and resurrection? But because he and the Father are one, if we come and we confess our sins to God, which we are supposed to do, that God will hear them because of the work of Jesus, because God and the Son are one. Jesus, this morning, is sitting right beside the Father, interceding on your behalf and mine. Is that not a comforting thought this morning? And what he wants to do is to hear your confession of your sin this morning, and he will take that right to the Father where it will be forgiven. If you're able, let me encourage you now to kneel for a time of personal confession.
corporate confession. Merciful God, we confess to you now that we have sinned in our relationships with our church family, with our neighbors, in the public square, and in our homes. Surely we have offended you in our dealings with one another. We have not displayed the Christ-like love we have received from our Savior. We look out for our own interest and have withheld love and affection from others. We have violated trust, been dishonest, and failed to keep our word. We have not respected others. We use people instead of serving them. We have not forgiven one another as we have been forgiven, and our hearts are full of bitterness. We are irritable, angry, and demeaning in our speech. We are quick to find fault, but slow to admit our failings. Our gossip and hatred is akin to murder. When confronted, we excuse ourselves blame others, or minimize our sin. We have not clothed ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We have not submitted to one another out of reverence for Christ. Father, forgive us. Send the Holy Spirit to us. He may give us power to live as by your mercy you have called us to live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear this assurance from the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, comfort my people, says our God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. In that great confidence, would you stand as we continue to worship? And continue to join me in prayer as we pray together. We are so thankful that we receive words, dear Father, like comfort, like tender, and pardon. We know, Lord, that these words are not deserving of our nature or our disposition. We're thankful for Jesus who brings pardon and brings hope to us when our hearts are heavy, when we're full of fear when we doubt and we lack any assurances. Be near to Jerry Tice and his family as they lost a nephew this week. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, for them to experience comfort and tenderness and a reminder that you care for them. We continue to pray with Candon and Tevin Terman as she's facing other medical decisions and issues about potentially heart surgery. Lord, she's praying for healing. We ask that you would heal her of this bacteria that's growing on her heart. And we pray, Lord, uh, for you to give the doctors wisdom. We continue to pray for others in our midst that are sick. We lift up Carolyn Tremere, Nancy Metzinger, Alan Blaylock, Dan, uh, David Hanks, Mildred Coleman, Renee Campbell, Hunter Baggs, Julia Joyner, Patty Edenfield, Jean Wade, and others that are battling illness, even silently, physical ailments. Lord, we ask for your help and your strength. Be near to Joan and Bob Walters as they grieve the death of their grandson unexpectedly this week. And uh, we, we ask you to be near to them. Remind them that you're a God who comforts, that's tender, and you give us hope in the gospel. We thank you for our missionaries of the cross that spread the gospel all around the world, that we have a part in the work that you're doing in Cusco, Peru. So we pray for Kristen and Nathan Henson and their work there with the medical campus outreach and the, hosp and the um, clinic that they lead there in Cusco. We pray for Luke and Noah and Silas, their children. Continue to bless the new physicians that have joined the medical team there. Thank you for the Daniel families that have returned to us, Mark and Rachel, as they integrate back into our fellowship here, and Mark is his new work here in town, but also for David and Brooke as they settle in Auburn and work with medical students there through medical campus outreach. Use Nathan and his skill uh, as an eye surgeon as he uh, blesses uh, these uh, dear uh, Cusco people and those throughout Peru. Use the clinic, Father, as a beacon of light. Use our missionaries of the cross to spread the gospel as we seek to spread the gospel in this city and to bring light and hope and healing. Lord, receive our prayers 
as disciples of Christ, we use the words that your son instructed us to pray when we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated and please pass the friendship pads.
body of Christ is beautiful because he died for her. And through that, we now have peace with God and with one another. Would you stand, please? The peace of the Lord be always with you. King who delight to bring him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to him. Their steady arms of mercy reach. Please be seated and turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 1 through 10 this morning. That's found on page 1892 in the Bible. 
provided for you in the pew. We are in week two of our four-week revisit, a four-week sermon series based on our theme verse that's on the outside of your bulletin. Pastor Mike prayed that, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. We'll be looking this morning at not for ourselves, but for others, discipleship. And also, let me just tell you, I'm excited to hear John Farmer preach tonight. He's our campus outreach staff person at Payne College. This will be, he's a pastoral intern, but he'll be continuing. We're in two weeks left in our Galatians series, but so come back tonight to hear John Farmer as he preaches God's word from the first time from this pulpit. We're excited about that. First Peter chapter five. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever, amen. This is the word of God. Thanks be to you, O oh God. Let's pray together. We humble our hearts before you, Father, that you love us and that you will draw near to us because of Jesus. Jesus, we worship you, our Savior. Holy Spirit, teach us this morning. Father, there's no way that I could speak to every heart here. Each person needs something different. Would your spirit take your word and apply it to each heart for Jesus' sake? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Culture tops vision. I was at a national church planning leadership conference a few years ago, and the speaker, the keynote speaker, opened his presentation with those three words, culture tops vision. He was a pastor of a mega church, over 20,000 members, multi-sites. He spoke with such authority and assurance as he exhorted these church planters that it's not your vision that's going to change the direction of your church. It's not your desires. It's not your goals. But ultimately, it's your culture, he said. It was sad and disappointing to know that within two years from that day, his elders were asking him to step down from leadership in his church because of his authoritarian and uh, dictatorial and autocratic style of leadership. But it does ask the question, what is culture? Miriam Webster named culture 2014 word of the year. And when their editors were asked why that that is the word of the year, they said, because most of us don't really know what it means. It was the most searched for word in 2014, the most used word that really is hard to pin down. But I think we know what culture is. A lot of times, uh, historically, it's been synonymous with the word civilization. But culture is really about growing things. We have agriculture. We have horticulture. Pop culture, which is growing trends. We've just, we've shortened that to trending, but uh, growing trends in culture. It, it means growing or cultivating. Pediatricians, you take a throat swab culture because you want to know what's growing down there in that throat, right? Well, culture is just your growth environment. 
And the reality is that we're all planted in growth environments. All of us have a reality and all of us are disciples. Even those outside the church are disciples planted in a growth environment. And uh, that growth environment is the people that you hang out with and the ideas and values that are most important to that group. And that's how you're being shaped. That's how you're being nurtured. That's how you're growing in your life. In the fourth century, Augustine, one of my favorite church fathers, wrote the book City of God. And in that, he says, all of humanity is under the influence of the city of man or the city of God. And he defined the city of man as when we're governed by the love of self or greed. And the city of God is when we're governed by the love of friendship, friendship with God and friendship with others. Well, Peter here says that Jesus governs his church by the grace of God. And it's to be a community of grace. And discipleship really is a pastoral ministry. The word pastor comes from the Latin word, which means shepherd. And pastoral ministry is just simply this, shepherding God's people. Peter says the central element to shepherding God's people is to leaders leading and shaping by grace. And that's because the single most important thing every human needs is the gift and touch of grace. Let me say that again. The single most important thing every human needs is the gift and touch of grace. So what is the culture of a church? Well, it's that environment where the single most important thing that every human needs, a touch or gift of grace, is cultivated by the leaders and explored and helped in helping members to experience the magnitude of that gift and to learn how to give it away to others. That's what the culture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is all about. Exploring the gift of grace, learning the magnitude of experiencing God's gift, and learning how to give it away. So the question for us this morning, how does God transform a person from a life of self-preservation to a life of selfless service? How does God change us from being disciples of our surroundings to being disciples of Jesus? Well, the answer is here. We must experience grace. And Peter tells us how to experience grace. We've got to enter into a grace environment. We've got to battle the enemies of grace. And we've got to find grace to embrace God. We'll see this in the passage here. But let me just reflect a minute on how grace touched Peter. No doubt when Peter wrote uh, chapter 5 here, he must have been thinking about John chapter 10. We read uh, John 10 this morning. He had to be thinking about Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. But he closes, Jesus closes that section by saying, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me, I give eternal life from them, and no one can snatch them from my hands. The Father has given them to me, and no one can snatch them from the Father's hands. He had to be thinking about John 10 when he wrote 1 Peter 5. But he might have also been thinking about John 18 when he betrayed Jesus. He promised he would never ever betray him and three different times he betrayed and cursed his Lord I'm sure he was thinking about John 21 and his restoration but prior to that after Peter promises that he'll never betray him Jesus said this to him Peter Satan has asked permission to sift you as wheat he said it's coming Peter <laughs> but he said I have prayed for you and when you return to me strengthen your brothers surely he was thinking about that promise that Jesus said I'll restore you and in John 21 on the beach Jesus comes to Peter the same place that he had met Jesus that first encounter and what does he say Peter do you love me then feed my sheep do you love me then tend my sheep do you love me shepherd my sheep surely Peter is thinking about what it means to be touched by grace and what it means to live and lead by grace. This preacher went on to lead 3,000 to Christ in his Acts 2 sermon, but he became a powerful pastor. And that's really what discipleship is. It's pastoring God's people. I've often said that discipleship is love training, but I think that this passage teaches us and reminds us that to understand love, you've got to understand grace. 
Well, let's look at how to understand grace. First, we gotta understand the environment of grace. And the environment of grace is shaped by its leaders and it's shaped by its message. It's, it's shaped first by its leaders. Notice that these leaders are involved. They're involved leaders. They're examples to the flock. They're among the flock. They lead not aloof or not on a pedestal, but they lead by making relationships a priority. They're involved leaders. But a grace-filled leader is also an inspired leader. They're inspired internally, not with external rewards or opportunities of power, but they're inspired by grace-filled motivation. Remember this, legalism is always demand from without. Grace-filled leadership is desire from within. And we see these leaders, they're inspired, but they're also interdependent. Notice that Peter says to the elders, he's envisioning a reality in the New Testament church that there was never singular solo leadership. It was always done as a team. In fact, in the book of Acts and forward, you never see solo pastors. You see teams, Peter, James, and John, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And here it's the interdependence of these elders that are working together. I, was, uh, I like to walk across and talk to the people who were playing basketball on our basketball court, just get to know them. Sometimes I get an opportunity to share my faith, but just uh, be inviting to them. And one day, uh, uh, one of the guys that was playing stopped me and said, hey, sir, are you a member of this church? I said, yes, I'm, I'm a part of this church. He said, I've been wanting to ask you a question. I said, sure. He pointed to the sign on the building and he said, what does Presbyterian mean? And I uh, see it says First Presbyterian Church. I said, well, it's pretty simple. It just means shared leadership. It means that we lead together. It means that we're interdependent, both lay and clergy. We're a team. It's interdependent leadership, but it's also internalized leaders who've internalized the message. As I mentioned, they're not just pointing the way, they're leading the way. That's what it means to be examples to the flock. And their focus is on the heart. Now I have to confess to you, I've been discipling people for 30 years, but at about the 15 year mark, I realized that I was probably taking an outside in approach to discipleship. I was putting a lot of emphasis on belief and on behaviors and not enough on being. And I had to have a total shift in my approach to discipleship. And that's what Peter's saying here is that discipleship has got to be internalized. And the focus has got to be on the inside out, not just the outside in. It's the same with you parents as you're discipling and guiding your children. You've got to learn to lead from the heart. You've got to learn to speak to the heart. And what does that really look like? So first, these leaders are involved, they're inspired, they're interdependent, they've internalized the message. Now, their mission is to instill the message. They're on a clear mission to instill the message. And I think a summary of that is really in verse one, where Peter uses the phrase, we are witnesses of Christ's sufferings and one who will share in the glory to be revealed. That's a snapshot summary of the gospel of grace right there. Now, often when I uh, first came to know the Lord, I, was, I would use the, acrostic, the grace acrostic to explain what grace is. You've probably used that before, haven't you? God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Here, Peter reverses this around and he says, at Christ's expense, we receive God's riches. Right there in verse one, he says, the witness of the sufferings of Christ and the glory to be revealed. God makes us a part of his family because of what Christ has done. And not only are we forgiven of the debt that we, that we deserve, we're given the riches of belonging to him and being a part of his family. We're God's covenant family. And he's relentless to teach us what it means to be a part of his family. First, you're accepted in his family because of what Christ has done for you. You're accepted and have been given a new identity. But you're also reminded that you belong to him. You've been given a new community. You're part of God's family and he is not only for you, he is with you and with, you're with his people. But then also he gives you significance, acceptance, a new identity, belonging, a new family, significance, a new mission. 
The gospel of grace totally teaches us that we've been made new people in Jesus. Grace takes lonely people and gives them friendship with God and one another. Grace takes demanding people and makes them grateful and thankful. Grace takes self-absorbed people and transforms them into servants. Well, how do spiritual leaders do this? Well, verse 2 really un- explains that. He's, uh, Peter says that we do this by both care and guidance. Now, the language there says, shepherd God's flock, those under your care serving as overseers. It's, it's basically saying as you care for them and as you watch over them, you instill the message. It requires caring and it requ- requires accountability or guidance. Sounds like two opposing forces, doesn't it? If I'm caring, then uh, why am I watching? And if I'm, if I'm guiding, do I really need to be caring? Well, really, the New Testament describes this as koinonia. It's the Greek word uh, for fellowship. Fellowship is a fascinating word, but it's also a frightening word because uh, it's, I think we're all for caring, but it's also for accountability. And really, you could translate this phrase watch over them more directly by saying spy on them now parents I know you've always wanted permission to spy on your children Peter gives you that right here he said it's your responsibility to watch over them now children you probably don't like that reality right there but that's what Peter's saying he says like a good shepherd watches over his sheep when the shepherd was would bring the sheep back into the pen he would take every sheep and he would inspect them, he would put them in his arms and he would look behind their ears to see if there was any insect bites and he would look under their stomachs to see if there were any scratches and he would look at their hoofs and he would gain insight for not only their safety but for the safety of the whole flock as he inspected each little sheep. You've probably seen the beautiful uh, picture of Jesus with the lamb around his neck. That was, uh, shepherds tell me, that was because most of the little lambs that stray away from the flock have to be brought back in line. And so the shepherd would put them, those little lambs around his neck so that the lamb would smell his smell and be acclimated to his voice. In fact, some straying sheep, I'm told, would have to have those little legs broken and they would have to, to heal Uh, near to the shepherd's heart so they could reorient their whole orientation yes it's care but it's also protection I like to think about it as the grace stream is two banks going down the salvation stream and one bank is the caring bank you'll say and one bank is the guiding bank and um, most of us are more comfortable on one side of the bank or the other You know, most of you people helpers, you really like the caring bank and you want to disciple others by nurturing them and caring for them. But if your bank, if your salvation stream only has one bank, the water dissipates. It loses its direction and it it loses its sense sense of uh, purpose and protection. Or maybe you're not a people helper, maybe you're more of a problem solver and you're always focused on accountability and you're focused on correction. Well, what this passage tells us is that the shepherd has self-awareness. He knows or she knows her orientation and she knows that probably if they're a people helper, they need to focus on guidance. And if they're a problem solver, they need to focus on care. It's all about being grace-centered and not self-centered. Because in grace relationships, people flourish. In grace relationships of transparency and vulnerability, we see interdependence grow. Now, I want you to know this. Independence is not a gospel value. It may be an American value, but it's not a gospel value. And we cannot grow independently. We grow interdependently. And that takes place in grace relationships. I like the, the word community probably better, but oftentimes we don't exactly know uh, the meaning of that word. Community that we use, our English word comes from a French word which comes from the Latin word communitas. It's two Latin words, cum, which means together or with, and then munis, which means fortified, strengthened, or reinforced. 
And so community is, is, the picture of community is reinforced togetherness. Reinforced togetherness. Our job as spiritual leaders is to remind those in our flock that they have reinforced togetherness because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Our job as parents is to remind those children under our leadership. We have reinforced togetherness. We need mentors who reinforce that reality. We need brothers and sisters that reinforce that reality. Meg Jay in her book, Defining Decade, wrote this book to 20-somethings. She, uh, from the University of Virginia, she writes and speaks particularly to 20-somethings. I would encourage you to look at her TED Talks. Don't do that now, please. But look at her TED Talks on the defining decade because she talks about the most important decade of development is the 20s not the first five years of life. And they have the data and the research to show how important that 20-something uh, decade is. But she scolds those 20-somethings and she says, you have built an urban tribe with a group of people that will allow you to say whatever you're feeling and uh, they won't judge you, which is good, but uh, they maybe make some suggestions, but they don't put any demands on you. And she says, that's only half of the equation of, of a growing environment. You need mentors. You need people who will guide you, upward mentors. You need people who will challenge you. I would say that's the same in our situation here. We need, we need people who will challenge us. Now I'm gonna to speak to the teenagers for just a second. Teenagers, the, your parents aren't listening, okay? But I'm just speaking to you right now, okay? It's just our little conversation. Most of you are messing up. And I want you to know that. I'm going to look you in the eye. Most of you are messing up because you don't want guidance from your parents. And you think that your friends know better. And I want you to know your friends don't know better. They're tethered to a ship that's drifting towards a cliff. Teenagers, you need to recognize, yes, you want caring from your parents. You need guidance from your parents. Parents. Mostly we need to show up, and I won't say shut up, but I'll say not speak up as much, okay? And we need to listen more. We need to hear them and give them a context where they can share what they're feeling and experiencing without judgment or without you trying to correct them, okay? We need grace for reinforced togetherness. But that's the vision here, husbands and wives. You need grace for reinforced togetherness. So the one that talks and gives direction, you need to listen more. And the one that uh, is aloof and pulls apart, you need to ask for help. That's how we grow in grace. It's called care and accountability. Now let's move quickly. What are the enemies? Well, the enemies of grace are two things. Peter sums it up real quickly. It's pride and it's fear. Pride and fear. He says, clothe yourself with humility towards one another for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He also says, cast your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. They're really two sides of the same thing, pride and fear. Let me define sin this way. Sin is not just weakness. Sin is not just a bad attitude. Sin is rebellion against, a rebellion against God's character and plan. And it's refusing to recognize God's grace in your life. At the core, sin is refusing to recognize God's grace in your life. So when you think I'm superior, when you think I know better, when you think I am better, that pride is in opposition to God. You know, if you've been around our church uh, before 2005, I know many of you have joined since 2005, but if you talk to a member who's been around before 2005, you'll tend to hear us say, we were a prideful church. God had to break us. We went through some really hard times, but we're a loving and unified church. Well, I think that's true, but there's something wrong with that statement. When we say we were a prideful church, <laughs> we are a prideful church. We do think that we know better, and we do think we have it figured out. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. You see, sin is clinging to pride or clinging to fear. And grace 
And growth is clinging to God. Sin is clinging to pride and clinging to, clinging to fear. Grace is clinging to God. And notice here in this passage, there's an enemy. There's a force beyond just your human interaction. It says the devil is your enemy and like a roaring lion is seeking to devour you. Now I'm going to talk more about the devil in Luke 4. When we get back into Luke, I'm going to talk about the temptation. But let me just mention this. Peter says that the window or doorway into your life that the devil exploits is pride and fear. His entree into your life is pride and fear. And how does the devil do that? He whispers in your ear to doubt that God is your advocate and to make you think that God is your adversary. He whispers in your ear through pride and fear that God is not your advocate, that he is your adversary. It says the adversary, the devil, is seeking, he's prowling about looking for a window through pride and fear. And he does that to cause you to cling to these idols instead of God. Well, we need grace to embrace God. What does that look like? Peter says it's humility. Humility is the grace that we need to embrace God. I define humility as just a posture of receptivity, a posture of receptivity where we're grace-filled. And Peter says that we understand God's character and we embrace, embrace his character, his mighty hand and his tender hand, and through God's favor, our humility calls us to rest on him. Let me just unpack that for just a second. Here, uh, Peter uses anthropomorphic language. It's a big word to say. He uses human terms to describe the deity, right? But he says, God has a mighty hand. He says, he says God's opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. He says, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time, casting your anxieties upon, uh, anxieties, upon, anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Okay, there we go. God has a mighty hand. But he has a tender hand. He loves us and he's going to give us what we need. Let me exegete sacramentally what humility is supposed to look like. It's really simple here. And it, it, it reflects your, uh, it, it, it is tied to your hands. He says you have to open your hands, hands open. That's surrender. Let go of control. He says hands open, but he also says hands down. I have to trust him. I have to believe in his promise. And then he says, hands free, I have to cling to him. And I have to worship him. Now let's just practice that for just, p p pull your hands out, here we go. Hands open, that's surrender. Hands down, that's trust. Hands free, that's worship. I hope that when you raise your hands at the end of the service, at the beginning of the service, you'll never forget it's got to start with open hands and it's got to go to downward hands before it's upward hands. Hands down, we surrender. H hands open, we surrender. Hands down, we trust. Hands open, we cling to him. Let me close with uh, two stories briefly. I was out visiting Carl Rogers this week, our um, member in exile in, at Hollywood. But uh, Carl is working there at Alcon Entertainment. He told me a story about Dennis Thompson here at First Pres. Carl was really wrestling to get to uh, find an opportunity uh, to enter the entertainment industry. He wanted to make films. He wanted to, he wanted to have an influence on society and culture through uh, his uh, to work with Hollywood. But he was working to position himself and prepare himself. And Dennis Thompson came to him and he said, you're not investing yourself and others in this church. You're just along for the ride and you're not being invested in. Carl, open your hands, hands down, so to speak, hands up. If this is what God wants, he will exalt you in due time. You follow him. And Carl was like, I really, I really 
uh, have been, have been self-absorbed on this pursuit of getting to this goal that I had. So he said, "What's amazing, Mike, is that once he started really investing in people and having people invest in him, all kind of doors started opening for him uh, to make it to Hollywood." And Dennis Thompson and the elders raised some money to help him get to a conference that ended up leading to him meeting the president of Alcon Entertainment, and he got an entry uh, job at Alcon Entertainment. The the agency that make the movies like Blindside, The Book of Eli, Sisterhood of Traveling Pants, Dolphin Tale. Well, Carl is now the creative executive for Alcon Entertainment. Ten years later, he runs the company. He decides which movies Alcon Entertainment commits to. And I said, Carl, tell me about this. How did you move from, you know, the guy that's uh, delivering coffee to the president and making sure his car is washed to... The creative executive, he said, Mike, it's really crazy. He said, everybody out here in Hollywood knows deep in their heart that they don't belong, but they're spending all their time trying to impress other people and they're trying to hide the fact that they don't belong. I know I don't belong, I already know that. And I know that I'm only here by God's grace. So I've just spent my time serving people and loving people and helping people in need and it's crazy. I just keep getting promoted. <laughs> And he said, now I run the company. And he said, you know, you know we're, they're talking about a buyout and I don't know what's going on and I want to fear. And he said, in so many words, he said, hands open, hands down, hands free. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. But then it says, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Let me close with this. In World War II, during the bombings, they noticed in England and in Wales, in the countryside, a phenomenon where the children were having a difficult time sleeping. And the children um, would just wake up in the middle of the night crying. And uh, they couldn't figure out what was going on, so they talked to the parents. They talked to the teachers. They talked to the physicians. And what they discovered as they listened to the children is the children were afraid that they were going to go hungry and they were going to wake up and there was not going to be any food. Now, food was scarce and they had some staples uh, here and there. Nobody was going hungry, but the children were fearful that they were going to wake up and they were going to go hungry. So someone suggested, why don't you give every child a loaf of bread and let them sleep with bread? And uh, just to remind them that they're going to have provision for what they need. It's called Sleeping with Bread. You can look it up and, and the, uh, what they've written about this. It was phenomenal. The children immediately just went right to sleep. Didn't eat the bread, didn't, didn't, didn't play. They just went right to sleep. As they were reminded, they have all the provision that they need. Now, here's an amazing thought. You are called every night to sleep with that nourishment with that bread that Jesus Christ has done everything for you what does it say the mighty hand of God the tender hand of God cares for you and you can sleep in peace but you know what's amazing this passage and other passages indicate we are the bread for the father he sleeps with us near his heart John 10 we just read it this morning it says I give eternal life to them. They shall never perish. And no one can snatch them, what? From my hands. We're in his hands, sleeping in the arms of Jesus. Members of First Presbyterian Church, let's build disciples together by grace. God's grace is so glorious. It's so beautiful. It's so radiant. It will never, ever, ever be eclipsed. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, dear God, that we are near your heart. We don't deserve to be there, but we belong to you as part of your dear family. Thank you, God, that you've promised to carry us to the very heart of heaven. No one can snatch us from your hand. May every person, the sound of hearing this testimony of grace, be drawn to the grace and love of Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
mention one thing. I included the groups that get together for sermon discussion. I included a grace-centered discipleship questionnaire that's in your bulletin. Now as you have open hands, downward hands, and upward hands, hands free, let's receive God's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit deliver gift of grace that you might be gracious givers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.